Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Ellis. I'm the publisher of Rural Lifestyle Dealer Magazine, and welcome to our first ever live webinar event. Today's event is being brought to you free, courtesy of Marketing Inventory Management, powered by MidStates Group. For just a little background, Rural Lifestyle Dealer was founded in 2007 when the Lesseter team saw the potential of this niche market and the need for targeted business information to help dealers sell to this developing niche. Now, RLD was originally a supplement to Farm Equipment Magazine, and uh, due to market demand, it's now a standalone quarterly publication serving uh, 12,000 print subscribers and many more thousands online with our website, our email newsletter, and our digital editions. Back in 2008, we started conducting a regular annual survey of dealers to discover the issues and trends impacting them the most. Now, in today's presentation, Lynn Wolf, our managing editor, will give us an inside look at the results of the most recent version of the survey. And Lynn will take a look at what economic indicators are saying about the potential for the market, which new products dealers intend to introduce or expand upon in their product mix, how much growth you can expect from the lines you carry, what dealers are most concerned about, and much more. Now, before we turn the controls over to Lynn, I have a couple of housekeeping items on your screen. There's a white arrow in an orange box. You can click on that arrow and choose question to open up a question field, and that will allow you to submit questions at any point throughout the presentation. Time permitting, we'll look to answer as many of those questions as we possibly can at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to all of them while we're online live, we'll send the remaining ones home with Lynn and she'll answer them, and we'll post those answers up on the website along with an archived video replay of the webinar, so you can go back at your leisure and review that if you'd like. Also, if for any reason your internet connection or our connection should happen to fail at some point, and it looks like the webinar has been interrupted, just go back to the email that you received earlier telling you how to join the webinar, and you can re-enter that way. With that, we are ready to roll. Thanks again for joining us, and I will now turn everything over to Lynn. Good morning, Lynn. Good morning, Michael. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. As Michael mentioned, Rural Lifestyle Dealer has been monitoring the market, and it's interesting to note the trends over the years. For instance, if we look just at five years ago, uh, the economy was experiencing a mortgage crisis and housing storm, and still Rural Lifestyle Dealers were optimistic. In fact, half of them predicted sales revenue to improve by 2% or more in 2008, and a full 15% said they expected revenue increases to uh, revenue to increase by 8% or more. And if we look at uh, what the top products were five years ago, of the 21 product groups in the survey we looked at then, dealers saw the best potential from power hand tools, as nearly 98% expected unit sales in this category to be at least, at least as good as or better than the previous year. Number two on the list for best bets in 08 were front end loaders. Nearly 40% of the dealers predicted front end loader sales to increase two to 7%, while nearly 17% expected sales to improve 8% or more. And wood handling products followed closely behind with 96% of dealers expecting unit sales to be as good as in 2008 as they were the previous year. And you'll see as we share results from uh, this year's survey how the market has matured in terms of the kind of equipment today's rural lifestyle dealers are demanding. Here's a breakdown of those who responded to our survey so you can see how you compare and who our sources are. First, readers are decision makers in their dealership with nearly half in management or ownership. Second, rural lifestyle dealers have good sized operations with nearly three fourths earning revenues of 2.5 million or more. In terms of region and dealership size, about 82% of the respondents are from the US and about 60% were from dealerships of 20 or fewer employees. Many of the dealers are firmly established in the rural lifestyle market more than 65% have served this customer base for more than 16 years. And this market continues to grow. More than 20% said their base had grown by more than 13% in the last five years. 
In terms of brands represented in the survey, so that you can see how you compare, the top five tractor brands, Kubota, New Holland, Maxi Ferguson, John Deere, and K5H. And the top five mower brands represented, Kubota, John Deere, Cub Cadet, Simplicity, and Ferris. There are several key economic factors that we watch for in the rural lifestyle market in terms of properties, disposable income, and the overall economic tone. Uh, first, we look at the unemployment rate, which has generally been holding steady, 5.6% uh, at the start of the year and about 5.5% today. We also look at home building indicators. Home builders are generally confident. They scored 57 at the end of the year and 56 uh, currently with 50 as, as neutral, according to the National Association of Home Builders Wells Fargo Index. Another interesting indicator to watch is the Rural Main Street Index from Dr. Ernie Goss of Creighton University. This index surveys community um, bank presidents and CEOs from 10 states in, in the central U.S. The index had been uh, much higher way back in June of 2013 when it was at 60.6. It was 50 in November when we started gathering information for this survey, and 43.6 today, uh, with 50 as, as neutral. This could indicate the influence of the pessimism related to the egg sector and lower commodity prices. And more data on the housing front. Numbers uh, from the U.S. Department of Commerce show the positive growth in millions of new home starts since the recent low in 2009. And now on to what our, our dealers have to say for the year. Generally, uh, as you can see, that the economic indicator, uh, indicators are positive and dealers are reflecting that optimism in their forecast. When asked what change they expect from rural lifestyle and landscape customers in 2015 versus 2014, nearly 40% expected revenues to be plus 2 to 7%. And overall, 84% expected revenues to be as good as or better than last year. And about 8% are very optimistic, expecting increases of 8% or more. Some dealers, however, uh, do have some type of pessimism, and about 16% think revenues could decline this year. In terms of aftermarket revenues, uh, dealers say that aftermarket sales should be strong in 2015, with 55.3% expecting increases of 2 to 8% or more. And nearly 1 in 10 dealers think growth could be as high as 8% uh, or more. And a large group of dealers expect a repeat of last year's good aftermarket revenue stream. The amount of dealers who think aftermarket revenue could decline is at 7.6%. In terms of what products are driving that growth, uh, the survey uh, ranks the potential of 26 product categories, and for yet another year, rural lifestyle dealers link the greatest revenue potential to zero-term mowers. More than half of the dealers in the survey more than 55% expect zero term mower sales to go 2 to 8% or more. And that's a strong ongoing statement following last year when nearly 65% of dealers forecast similar growth. The other equipment in the top five also ranked in last year's top five with some switching of positions. Slightly more than 48% of dealers expect revenues from tractors under 40 horsepower to increase 2 to 8% or more. Tractors in the 40 to 100 horsepower range, ranks number three, with 43% of dealers expecting revenues to increase 2 to 8% or more. Rotary cutters ranked number four, and utility vehicles rounded out the top five. About 42% of dealers expect rotary cutter sales to increase 2 to 8% or more, and about 39% expect increases of 2 to 8% or more for utility vehicles. In terms of what products dealers will add this year, zero term top the list of the product lines with the most potential, and they also made the top five list of products dealers plan to add in 2015. The top position, however, goes to tractors. 
More than 33% of dealers plan to add tractors in the under 40, 40 horsepower category. Tractors in the 40 to 100 horsepower range and skids your loaders tied for the number two position. With uh, nearly 31% of dealers planning to add categories to those uh, lineups this year. And then nearly 30% of dealers plan to add utility vehicles in 2015. The survey also gauged the optimism of U.S. Canadian dealers. About 82% of Canadian dealers expect revenue increases similar to 2014 or up to 7%. And that compares with about 75% of dealers who had a similar forecast. The U.S. had more optimism, optimism at the upper end with nearly 10% expecting growth of 8% or more. And that compares with about 4% of dealers, of Canadian dealers, expecting similar growth. Fewer Canadian dealers than U.S. dealers expect revenues to decline this year. That's 13% compared with 16%. Canadian dealers also have more optimism in terms of aftermarket revenues. About 96% say aftermarket revenues will be as good as or better than last year. And that compares with 90% of U.S. dealers. Fewer Canadian dealers than U.S. dealers forecast declines in the aftermarket, 4% versus uh, 16%. And when comparing forecasts um, based on size, those from small dealerships, uh, those with 20 or fewer employees, are slightly more optimistic than their larger counterparts. About 48% of small dealerships of small dealerships expect revenue increases of 2 to 8% or more, and that compares with 46% for large dealerships. However, larger dealers or those with 21 or more employees are more optimistic when it comes to aftermarket revenue. About 57% of those expect re aftermarket revenues to increase 2 to 8% or more, and that compares with 54% of small dealers who expect similar increases. Our survey also looked at how dealers of five major brands viewed 2015 in terms of revenue and aftermarket revenue. Case IH dealers were consistent in both revenues and aftermarket revenues. And they ranked uh, second for both. However, uh, Kubota topped the list of optimism for revenues with 60% expecting revenue increases of 2 to 8% or more. John, De John Deere dealers were most optimistic for aftermarket revenues with 4% expecting increases of 2 to 8% or more. Uh, dealers also shared in their report other aspects of their businesses including what they are most concerned about, many of which they and you have little control over. Finding good employees top the most concerned list. With uh, more than 50, or at 56% of dealers listing that as their top uh, concern. Based on interviews with dealers over the uh, past year or so, it seems to be, uh, this concern seems to be based on a number of factors. For instance, several dealers have mentioned that the oil and gas industry lures many qualified workers away with high wages they can't compete with. It will be interesting to see how this pans out this year as the boom in that industry seems to have peaked. Other dealers have referenced benefits packages that other companies offer they can't match. And another uh, possible factor with finding good employees um, could be related to today's equipment that requires uh, a new kind of skill, skill technician to address the technology. Low sales margins tops the concern list and are another difficult to, issue to address. Rural lifestyle dealers in particular may face unrealistic price expectations for, from customers who may be more familiar with big box prices. We also ask dealers to answer this question. What would you change about your, ma your manufacturer? And we appreciated the honest answers. 
Some several dealers reference inventory concerns in terms of having to order six to eight months ahead without the flexibility to adjust to uh, unexpected demand. Here's comments from a New York dealer who talks about the lean and mean just in time just in time inventory and not being able to adjust. And here are comments from an Illinois dealer who also talked about the lead time with uh, the 68 month lead time and not uh, being able to adjust if you don't have enough on order. Requirements for manufacturers were another concern. Certification, costly and frequent training required for service technicians and what some view is unreasonable unre expectations for performance were some of the examples cited. Here's a comment from an Ohio dealer who talks about the amount of work required to be a certified dealer um, and saying that some of it he thinks is a waste of time. And a comment from a Wisconsin dealer that talks about uh, market share performance and how they always do well and, and doesn't agree with that metric in terms of the contract. And warranty comes up again and again when we talk with dealers. Many feel they are not being reimbursed enough for the time and hassle, and some dealers have commented that they have to fix manufacturer mistakes when they do warranty repairs. And here's a comment from a Kansas dealer who talks about warranty repairs and the flat labor rate having no basis in shop reality. Here was an interesting comment from a New York dealer who says that manufacturers need to view dealers more as partners for them both to be successful. Dealers also share, share their strategies for growth, sharing whether they were going to expand at their current location or add location. A good share said that growth was possible at their existing store, so stores through products, enhanced marketing, or other ways. A Missouri dealer referenced the mega dealer strategy that drives business to a smaller store. A Wisconsin dealer referenced how dealers in the area open a new location only to enclose it a short time later. And he talks about the buy one, close one antics. And others said that adding location was the only way for them to stay competitive in their market, referencing the idea that they are a long-term player and they need to be uh, have scale to be critical, or is critical to that staying uh, competitive. Here are comments from a New Brunswick dealer, and then also an Indiana, Indiana dealer. What else do you need to know for 2015? We recommend tuning into three main trends. Technology, which is improving fuel efficiency, serviceability, and functionality. New segments as part of a one-stop shop strategy. And UTVs as the hot ticket, uh, again, in 2015. Technology is going beyond engines and dashboards and extending to things like tires and mobile applications. John Deere announced its Michelin X2 Turf Airless Rail Tire for its commercial Z-Track mowers. Cubs Cadet now offers a Bluetooth application for its Enduro series of lawn tractors that alerts owners about maintenance. Those manufacturers with entry into new segments as part of that shop strategy include Billy Goat with its uh, plugger brand of aerators, which allows the company to expand be beyond its traditional fall cleanup. And Toro announced its acquisition of Boss Snow and Ice Management Business for Northern Star Industries. And that third trend, the UTVs, uh, they're part of that big push in reaching those new segments. Uh, Gravely is running a new category with its Atlas JSV, or job site vehicle, that it developed with Polaris. 
Exmor Pintoro unveiled their new UTV model in partnership with Arcticat. Hush Hustler purchased a European equipment line. Mahindra is partnering with Intimidator. And Cub Cadet recently introduced its Challenger UTV. There are some important influencers to watch here at home and abroad. First, uh, the 2014 Farm Bill provides $30 million annually to the farmer's market and local food promotion program. That's up $10 million provided annually for the previous program. The Specialty Crop Block Grant Program is now receiving $72.5 million annually to promote fruit and vegetable production. That compares with the $52 million that had been allocated. And USDA also established new resources for organic farmers, including funding in organic cost share programs at $11.5 million annually. Also, I had the opportunity to attend uh, the EMA International Show in Bologna, Italy this past November to learn about issues facing the European ag sector. The European economy is trending down, and European farm equipment manufacturers see the U.S. as the best opportunity for exports. In terms of recent numbers uh, regarding U.S. imports, uh, U.S. imports of farm machinery from Italy increased by 7.2% 7 7 in 2014 compared with last year, and U.S. imports of farm machinery from France increased by 23% in 2014 compared to the previous year. We discussed many factors here for success, but here, are, but there are two key ones that are the backbone of any dealership, and both are related to branding. First, the equipment brand you have chosen gives you a great head start in making sales. Real lifestyle dealers, um, or real lifestyles, are doing more and more research online and are coming into your store with a preference for your brand, as well as preference for models and features. Dealers say that more than half of customers, 54.6%, arrive at their dealership with a specific brand or unit in mind most of the time or almost always. And that compares with similar numbers from 2014 when 59.4% of dealers reported the same brand awareness. Second, leverage your own, your own dealership team as a brand. Regardless of how much research rural life sellers have done, they still need someone to validate their information and open their eyes to what they don't know. Dealers say that nearly 78% of customers accept their product recommendations most or all of the time. And dealers have been able to maintain that high level of respect over the years. Last year, dealers said that about 76% 76, 76 of customers accepted their product recommendations most or all of the time. Finally, be bold in securing your future for the short and long term. For instance, Armstrong Implements of Swift Current Saskatchewan, who was our 2014 Dealership of the Year, had a successful farm equipment dealership but decided their future was in a smaller, hands-on, single-store location, primarily selling rural lifestyle equipment. They made that decision in 2005, and in 2013, they posted more than $7 million in revenue from a staff of 10. Owner Bob Talega says, we know the product and can provide the financing and service our customers expect. We try to create a one-on-one -on -one, a one -on -one relationship. This concludes the first part of our presentation about current trends and growth strategies. Now I'll turn it back over to Michael. Thanks, Lynn. That was a, a very nice look at the market here and what we can expect in 2015 and beyond. We've got a couple of questions that have come in here. Um, first question, what benchmarks are dealers using to determine which line they will focus on in retailing? Uh, well, thank you. Um, in terms of when we talk with dealers, uh, dealers often talk about averages, such as looking at uh, three-year sales averages, to help them identify trends in terms of what's 
uh, products demand increasing as well as decreasing. And then uh, also just factoring in special circumstances like extreme weather or, or some uh, local uh, factor. And then that average is just generally validated based on their experience and what they're hearing from customers. Um, we hear dealerships talk about having a gut feeling uh, after they talk with customers and they look at sales averages to just have them base their, um, their forecasts on. And uh, when we looked at uh, the survey this year, we ranked our 26 categories. Um, I shared the top five in the survey. And, and just to share a little bit more, if we look at going down through uh, the top 10, um, six through 10 included hay tool balers, front end loaders, snow removal equipment, skid steer loaders, and lawn tractors. And so you can see uh, the wide variety there. And one big uh, mover in that category was uh, snow removal equipment, which, which moved way up on the list and uh, compared with last year. And I think that um, we can all agree it's related to the extreme weather. Um, and we also looked at, at what dealers were thinking in terms of what we call a, a weighted average. So we looked at um, the, um, the about the same figures were not factored in. And so we just looked at increases compared with decreases. And that top five uh, held steady in terms of uh, just looking at that weighted average, with dealers for mowers being number one, tractors under 40 horsepower, number two, tractors 40, 100 horsepower, number three, and then rotary cutters and utility vehicles. So in terms of how you made your projections this year, um, I hope they were close to matching what uh, we found there in terms of what dealers consider to be the top products for the year. Great. Uh, before I get to the next question, just to remind everybody, uh, if, you, if you have a question, feel free to, uh, to submit them. Just uh, There's a white arrow in the orange box. Click that arrow and choose the question to open up that field, and then uh, we'll be able to see your question come through on our side. Uh, next question. Lynn, does the category of utility vehicles include mobile service trailers? Um, not in terms of what our our survey looked at. So it's a, it's an interesting question, but we looked at just uh, straight UTVs. Okay. Next up, how are dealers adjusting their showroom sales process to fit today's tech-savvy, more informed customers? Uh, we talk about that a lot in terms of the new kind of uh, rural lifestyle uh, customer and how dealers can uh, sell it to them versus some of their other customers, such as uh, production farmers. Uh, and I've, over the conversations with dealers, I've seen several good examples of how um, dealerships have incorporated tech technology right onto the sales floor. Um, for instance, AgriVision, which was our 2013 dealership of the year, um, and then another dealer I recently profiled, Franklin Equipment of Ohio, um, they have kiosks on the store um, for in-store uh, videos and uh, to let the rural lifestyle who's used to finding information on their own, on their computer, kind of translate that experience into the store. So if, if they want to look on their own or if a salesperson has to, happens to be tied up, um, a salesperson can give them a, a hello, direct them to a, a kiosk, um, or video screen to gather some more information until they can get to them. We've also heard about dealers that are using um, iPads for both salespeople and, and their service uh, and part uh, counters so to make them more mobile to move throughout the store with the customer. Um, so in terms of technology, a lot of our dealers just tell us again and again that it comes back to just really kind of old-fashioned uh, good uh, sales techniques um, with just greeting customers immediately when they come in and just making them uh, feel important. Um, for instance, Armstrong Implements, our, our 2014 dealership of the year, the three owners uh, sit, have their offices right at the front of the store so that when anybody comes in, they are immediately greeted by one of those three or maybe more than one of those three. So I think in terms of the new kind of customers, it's you know recognizing the amount of research that they've done and um, allowing them to maybe continue some of that in the store with some of that need to, to use technology, but sticking with your original good uh, sales tactics. Great. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, next one. Could short lines be a great opportunities for dealers during this tough year? <laughs> well, 
Well, again, uh, when we looked at those top ten products, and I had mentioned I'm um, going down further on that list, you'll see uh, things like rotary cutters and hay, to hay tools um, made that top ten. And even if we go on down further into the, the list of 26, um, for example, 33 percent of um, I'm sorry, excuse me, 25% uh, of dealers ex expect uh, similar growth this year for finishing mowers and 22% for tillers. So you can see some of the um, the good um, go-to products are still sh uh, showing some good uh, sales growth for this year. Um, and then just to provide an anecdote from a, from a dealer, um, and I spoke with uh, SNH Farm Supply for a recent issue. Um, Eric Roach, the store manager, made a comment um, that a cu if a customer leaves the store, he feels the deal is lost. So uh, you know that rural life sellers uh, don't have that same kind of brand loyalty. So um, short lines help make, help keep the customer in the store to keep that conversation going. Um, because many of you have said that if that customer leaves the store, um, they're going on to another dealership or another big box store to buy, you know, buy, even by that day. Okay, and this one kind of dovetails off that last question. What seems to be the trend in the number of brands dealers are carrying? Are they adding more? Are they trying to limit or minimize the number of brands they carry? But what, what sorts of trends are you seeing there? Um, it's, it's hard to identify just a trend there. I mean, I'm seeing on both ends of the, of the spectrum. A lot of, um, like, for example, Armstrong Implements is another good example where they looked at you know, what customers need and and adding that in there, so some of the requests that they were getting, but then trying to stick with uh, brands that uh, offer the quality they're looking for. So maybe they're trying to expand on a product line, but if they can't find a product line that offers the quality, they're not gonna they're not gonna offer it. Uh, they just won't carry it. So I, I think that's the dilemma with uh little lifestyle dealers and that in terms of being able to have the variety to serve the different types of customers, because you do have a, a wide range of customers, and so having that variety but still maintaining, as we mentioned earlier, still maintaining your own uh, dealership brand so that you're not, you're not the um, end-all to be-all if you don't have the quality product. So I think that um, in terms of the trend, I'm not sure I answered that question, in, in terms of each, uh, how, it, how it falls, um, but I do think it's an individual question that, that dealers have to answer in terms of having the products they need in the store but still maintain their uh, quality and their own brand. Good. All right, next up, what multi-channel marketing strategies are dealers utilizing to drive additional footsteps and increase volume into their locations? And uh, what are they doing to make those efforts uh, seamless across uh, platforms? Well, a lot of the, the new marketing these days, and especially to reach the real life stars, excuse me, I have to do with, with online. So really looking at, um, of course, your web presence, uh, your uh, social media presence. Um, the websites have, have really changed over the years. I mean, the, the early websites were really more online brochures, and um, you'll see a lot more of the more progressive dealerships are, are finding ways to be uh, proactive. Um, or I'm sorry, interactive. Um, uh, Franklin Equipment comes to mind again. Uh, they have an online chat. So there's looking for, for ways to be interactive, and, and that translates also with how social media um, can impact the dealership. Um, uh, real lifestyle customers are online. They're online when they can't be at your store, like the network. And so you can still maintain that, that interaction through your uh, social media channel. And just uh, I, some of the good... Uh, Examples I've seen recently are just making sure to, to pull in the content array that your uh, manufacturers are giving you, and then also to provide, uh, just look at yourself as a, as talking to them through social media during the day. Um, I profiled Nord Outdoor Power Equipment, and, and um, Doug Nord just did quick uh, videos when he had a new product come in or a question that he's hearing over and over again. He does a, a quick video and, and posts it on uh, his Facebook page. So um, it's really just looking for, for new ways to interact and, and be more personal with customers. There's still the tried and true. Uh, we still hear people talk about, um, you know, radio seems to be a, excuse me, a, um, a reliable source. Um, there's still some direct mail, you know, still some newspapers, 
a lot of that has, has to do with you know knowing your own your own market. But really, the over overarching trend in terms of marketing has to do with you know interaction, engagement, being personal. We hear a lot about the word authentic. So don't be something that you're not yet that you're not, but find ways to show off what you are. Great. Um, here's one earlier on in the, in the presentation, you alluded to uh, customers coming in with a brand in mind. Um, one of our visitors wants to understand how do dealers make that work to their advantage, knowing that some, that many of the customers that come through the front door are coming in with a specific brand in mind. How do they work that to their advantage? I think it just goes back to the, um, the overall uh, asking questions so that when a customer comes in, you're doing the good, the good qualification in terms of, of what they, uh, you know, who they are, what kind of properties they have, and just asking them in terms of, of what kind of research they've done and uh, so that you can kind of key into some of the messages they're already telling you. Um, we've heard from from some dealers. Um, I'm, tr I'm thinking of Steve Armstrong in our, our recent story about about upselling. Um, he, you know, acknowledges, <laughs> excuse me, the amount of research that they've done. He tries to pull out some of their, you know, their their preferences. But he says a lot of the the dealers, you know, may uh, I'm sorry, a lot of the customers don't know all of the options available. Um, so there's a way that you can kind of key into that brand that they're looking for and still offer expertise in terms of what they don't know about. Yeah, probably pretty, pretty important for the dealers and their sales force to know their product lines intimately too, so they can be that, that resource for their customers coming in. Um, right, and, that, and that is a challenge we hear from dealers in, talks in terms of, you know, there's a lot of new options coming out, a lot of new models. And it really is um, a challenge for dealers to make sure that their salespeople are educated, so that that they do, um, you know, they do have low well, at least as much as the rural life sellers coming in. Well, and here's one that kind of dovetails off that point: I, How do dealers prefer to be educated about new product lines or new products within the established lines that they're working with? Um, well. We are hearing from dealers that it is a challenge for them to leave their, to have their service tax leave their dealership or have, have their sales people leave the dealership. And that does come back to the point earlier about some of the concerns they had um, with the manufacturer with, with certification. So there's, um, there has to be some of that on, you know, that, that hands on um, at offsite. But we are, are hearing, you know, more and more and, uh, about the online component. So that it allows the dealers to, you know, better structure the schedule, uh, to pull some the service techs or sales people off the floor to do some online training, and then go back to the floor. So um, it is a challenge for dealers. You know, you can't replace that hands-on learning, especially in terms of your service technicians, and especially with the new technology. Um, but there, there does need to be um, a balance. And, and today's computer world allows online learning and, and webinars like this to be a good, a good option. Great. Uh, next one. Due to the number of brands that offer compact tractors today, are you seeing customers shopping for the cheapest price out there? And if not, what is driving their purchase decision? Well, you'll always have price shoppers, uh, budget shoppers. And um, just in terms of, I, I'm thinking again about the upselling story that we just did in our spring issue. Um, there was a comment from one of the dealers where they were talking about time being a driving factor. So that um, some people do come in starting with price, but, but really if you can talk to them about um, how much time they have, how much time they can save, that can kind of direct uh, customers a little bit more, it, um, or direct uh, choices a little bit more, and then also some of the some of the options, um, especially with a variety of ages in the rural lifestyle uh, market. I mean, there's there's certain comfort features that can uh, help drive sales for one type of customer that that might not for another type of customer. So I think it's um, it, you know you'll always have the price shopper, as I said, but but with the options and the models. Um, there are many more ways to, to, to direct a customer 
And they're also, it seems to be, you know, rural lifestyle is beyond, you know, purchased beyond what, you know, uh, many field people might think that they, they would need for their property. Um, just because it's a, it's a it's a fun purchase for them, it's a, you know their one time purchase of a tractor, and they want to make sure that it's the the right one for them. So, um, you know, you always have to be ethical when you sell. But um, talking about horsepower and that added horse horsepower, maybe just what they're looking for. Great. Uh, okay, Lynn, uh, are you seeing? Any signs of increasing mobile service strategies based upon a focus on aftermarket revenue contribution? Yeah, we do see some of our, uh, maybe our larger dealerships uh, adding the, the mobile service. Um, <laughs> if if um, AgriVision was, um, whether well, A&M Green, Green Power when we interviewed uh, them, uh, for our dealership of the year in, in 2013, and now AgriVision, but they had a, a, a mobile service, and um, if you go online, you can see some of the, the videos about that, where they talk about um, just really kind of going out into a neighborhood and and just um, setting up setting up a, a little uh, offsite shop and just having uh, customers come to them while while they're there. So. Um, you know, the, the idea uh, again, it has to come. It comes down to um, understanding the real lifestyle market, some of the time constraints they have, um, also the constraints in terms of not having trailers. So, you know, how can you capture the service business of real lifestylers that can't get their equipment to you? And uh, a mobile service, uh, you know, like a regular route might be a way to might be a way to do that. Um, there's challenges, of course, with that in terms of having the having the equipment. Um, and the person, and also setting the expectations in terms of what types of repairs can be done off-site. Um, but it is a, a great way to, to get out there and to get out there other than uh, on the sales side, to get out there on the service side. Okay. Um, regarding UTVs and ATVs, obviously there's a lot of activity in that in that particular product niche. How much room for growth is there on these products? Well, it seems to be uh, the exciting uh, uh, product. Uh, you know, zero turns are, of course, still as popular as ever, and, and uh, more and more rural sellers are finding them. But but ATVs uh, really seem to be uh, the hot ticket, uh, as I said. Uh, they made the top five uh, this year. Uh, they also made the top five last year. Um, and when you look at it in terms of just looking back through some of the numbers here, um, last year, uh, about 53% expected a 2.8% increase over 2013, and um, and going back another a previous year, there was a growth, 44% uh, expected growth of 2 to 8% or more. So you can see the trend of of strong growth, 30 and 40% over the last three years. So that seems to be, you know, a a good a, a, a bona fide top seller. Uh, and then again, the customization I think is really captured a lot of attention of uh, UTV, or possible UTV customers when you look at, you know, uh, colors and camouflage and and, uh, and and lighting options and uh, seating options, attachments. It just, it really seems to be um, a, a way to, to reach a different kind of customer, you know, the work customer, the recreational customer, uh, the hiking customer. So it has a lot of versatility, which, which makes it a, um, lead to the, the top seller. Absolutely. Do, do are dealers seeing equipment customizations such as changing tire and wheel options, etc., as a challenge? I think it's a challenge in terms of in terms of the conversations with with customers. Um, you know, keeping the conversation going, finding out what their um, you know what their key points are. <laughs> Excuse me, but um, again, thinking of an opportunity um, that might be a way to to upsell. It might be a way to uh, capture a customer from a from another dealership with some of those additional options. So it, it makes things a little bit harder when you have to kind of get into some of those um, some of those details, um, especially with with customers who may not be as familiar with with them as like the, uh, some of your other customers might be. 
Um, but I, I think anytime, and from what dealers say, anytime you're able to keep a conversation going with customers, show differentiation among products, um, show versatility of products, um, I think that that can help make a sale. Great. It, it, this one changes gears a little bit here. How are lower oil prices impacting equipment sales and which categories and geographies are most impacted? Excuse me. Um, that's a topic that we had talked about within uh, Lesseter uh, publications, just in terms of uh, the overall economy. And I know that on the larger egg side, it, it seems to be uh, more of an impact. And, uh, Dave Pinnicky, the editor of uh, Farm Equipment Magazine, um, has looked at that, and, and he has said that in terms of um, you know, lower fuel prices, um, they might be offset by lower commodity prices, and there's also drought conditions that, that farmers have to contend with, um, which might mean, you know, less production or fallow acres. Um, so in terms of our market, you know, oil prices are probably directing a rural livestock customer's position, um, a purchasing decision. Uh, they might might have some impact in terms of the uh, the landscape market. but. But just overall, um, I'm not hearing from dealers in terms of, you know, what that the oil prices might affect equipment sales. When, I, when, I'm, when they're talking about the uh, oil industry, it really has to do with some of the challenges that they've had with securing employees rather than impact on, on, on sales. Okay. Uh, what impact do you think drought conditions will have on the rural equipment market? Um, well, excuse me. The drought is, is something that that I watch closely. I'm I'm based in Kansas, and we had a couple years of drought, and it it just doesn't seem to go away. And of course, California is is struggling, in many other areas of the country. Um, I recently did a uh, editorial on the topic for our uh, online e-brief newsletter, and so I have a, a data here from the uh, National Climatic Data Center that 21% of the contiguous U.S. fell in the moderate to extreme drought categories, and that was at the end of March. So, um, you know, it's not just California, not just, it's not just Texas. A, a lot of the country is being affected. Um, and in that story, I looked at a um, Napa Valley, California, which actually banned front lawns um, because they just, um, I'm assuming, just couldn't get people to stop watering. Um, so. And then also just in terms of trends and how the drought now is um, just not a you know weather topic, but how it's affecting trends. Um, Xeriscaping is is becoming more and more popular outside of you know what used to be a desert, uh, you know a southwest trend um, of planting you know drought uh, tolerant plants instead of lawns. Um, GIE Expo, I know many of you attend. Uh, you've seen the hardscape North America. Um, there, which is a, a show that where vendors display uh, bricks and paving. So it definitely, definitely is affecting on the rural textile market. You know, we, you'll still have customers that love to mow and want to mow uh, and have pastures to maintain. So there'll still be, you know, they'll still be mowing, they'll still be haying, but it's um, definitely times that, that dealers look at how to, how to take part in this new trend. Um, zero escaping, there has to be preparation. So, you know, look at what equipment you have to help uh, rural life sellers uh, prep their property or, or they maintain the property after they insert or uh, install some of these hard skate elements. Wonderful. All right, that's all. That's what we've got for questions submitted. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to get the information into us. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, we're going to have today's presentation and audio up on RuralLifestyleDealer.com in the event you'd like to go back and review it. And, uh, and if you think of a question after we're done here, feel free to email it in to us. But watch your email and our email newsletter, eBrief, for more information on when that will be posted to the website. And as promised, we're going to share a copy of the, uh, the Dealer Business Trends Report with everybody that attended and registered today. We'll send you a note along with a link to it so you don't have to worry about writing anything down right now. On behalf of Lynn and the rest of the Rural Lifestyle Dealer team, as well as the folks at Marketing Inventory Management, powered by Midstates, Mid -States, thanks very much for joining us today. When you leave the webinar, a short survey will pop up. 
Please let us know what you think of the live event and let us know if you have any topics that you'd be interested in seeing covered in the future. Thanks again for stopping in today. Keep an eye out in the coming weeks. Uh, we're going to announce our next uh, webinar in the series. Mike Wiles is going to bring his 20 years of retail and wholesale equipment sales experience to the table and share insights about managing the sales process with the novice rural lifestyler. Thanks very much.